Hello and welcome to Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you want to support me. You can also join my Patreon. We are raising money for a very important cause. I will talk about that at the end of the video. Today's episode is being brought to you by Valium. <laughs> kind of kidding, kind of not. You know I am a big horror movie fan and I've also got a pretty strong stomach. But there are a couple of things that I hate. I hate anything that has to do with eyeballs. Eyeballs freak me out. And I hate closed spaces. I hate small spaces. I don't totally freak out, but I don't love it. In, I would say, about 1997, I was with a group of about 15 of my dance students in Las Vegas at a summer dance convention. We parked my big Suburban that I would borrow from my mom every summer for this event. I parked it in the Mirage parking garage and we all piled into the parking garage elevator. It was like 110 degrees that day and the parking garage elevators didn't have air conditioning back then. As soon as the elevator doors closed, we were stuck. The elevator didn't move. Um, after a minute or so, it was hot. After a few more minutes, it was really, really hot. The girls were terrified. So here I am, I'm only like 26 years old at the time and I've got all these teenage girls that I'm in charge of. They're starting to panic and I'm starting to panic. I'll spare you the details, but it was bad. We got out of the elevator, but somewhere in my lizard brain, a switch was flipped. I've spent the last 20 some odd years trying to find that switch to flip it off. I've done exposure therapy. I've done anxiety and meditation training. Not only can I not find the switch, I can't even find the room in my brain that the switch is in. <laughs> I don't like tight spaces. So today's episode for me is kind of my worst nightmare. I can't imagine what would cause anyone to want to go into a cave. It's just something that doesn't appeal to me at all. My husband was shocked when about, I don't know, I'd say 2016 or so, we were living in Austin, Texas at the time. I agreed to go to Carlsbad Caverns with him. I did fine in the cave until we got to the elevator at the bottom of the cave to take it back up to the surface. And I was like, nope, nope. And I walked all the way back up the wrong way against traffic. And that's how I got out of the cave. It was fun, I'm glad I did it, but I won't be doing it again. So please forgive me today if you see a little sweat on my upper lip or if I seem more crazed than usual because this episode on my Dark Stories playlist is about as dark as they get, literally. Today I have for you two stories, two horror stories of cave disasters. I'm your host, Stacy Lee. Let's begin. story begins in 1967. This is Mossdale Caverns. It's a cave system in Yorkshire Dales, England. It's a limestone cave associated with a large stream. In the 1940s, a famous spelunker named Eli Simpson became convinced that there was a large undiscovered cave system under a very small opening. And so in 1941, he and a group of female co-workers from the aircraft factory that they worked at decided to try and map this new cave system. I guess there was a man who was in the area and he dropped a tobacco pipe. And when he dropped his pipe, it fell for a long time before it hit the ground. So that was kind of their clue that there was a cave here. So the cavers went into the cave and they found it to be challenging. I'm not really sure who just is like, hmm, there's a hole in the ground. I need to go in there. <laughs> I, I just, I'm not going into just random holes in the ground. I, I'm not doing it. The cavers find that this particular cave is full of water. They're up to their necks at times. And the cave is so long, they never see the end of it. Not until 1964 do Mike Boone and Pete Livesley find the end of the cave. From the entrance to the far end and back again, it takes between eight and 10 hours to explore. It's a very large cave system. So now it's 1967 and a group of friends decide that they're going to explore what has become known as Mossdale Caverns. There were two groups of cavers, one called themselves the Happy Wanderers and the other called themselves the Bradford Pothole Club. There were 10 cavers all together, but there are six young men at the heart of the story today. Six who were especially excited to see this wonder of nature. The group is made up of Dave Adamson, Jeffrey Boireau, 
William Frakes, John Ogden, Michael Ryan, and Colin Vickers. Now, just to be clear, this is a cave that many people had already died in at this point. There were deaths at that cave starting in the 1940s. By this time in 1967, there had been 32 deaths in the caves, most of them by drowning, but some of them were attributed to falls. This was a dangerous cave system and everyone knew it. Still, these young adventurers were dead set on going into the caves. There had been a prolonged dry spell that summer. It was July, and so the risk of flooding, they felt, was very minimal. The group set out on June 24th, 1967, excited about exploring. Now, these caves, to me anyway, look menacing, even in broad daylight. The black, craggy surface jutting up out of the lush greenery. It looks ominous. The cave is classified as super severe, meaning it is in the most dangerous category for cavers. Experts call the cave a freak of nature because it's really two caves in one. You enter through a narrow crevice and then the cave winds for almost seven miles underground. There is a part of the trek known as the marathon crawl where you go for miles and miles on your belly with the roof of the cave being just inches above your head hard pass. The obsession for cavers is to find the link that connects the two cave systems that make up the system. Because apparently you can go in this way and you can go in that way, but what they're really looking for is the spot where the caves connect if one of those exists, if that spot exists. So on June 24th, 1967, the group of 10 spelunkers enter the narrow passageway and start exploring. After about three hours, four members of the Happy Wanderers decide that they've gone as far as they're comfortable going, and they turn around and go back to the entrance of the cave and exit safely. This leaves the six members I named a few moments ago in the cave. They've decided that they're going to stay in the cave and go deeper inside the earth. As the four cavers exit, it's about five in the afternoon and it is starting to rain. Three of the cavers went back to Ingleton to get some dinner. But one caver, a woman named Mirage Forbes, stays near the entrance of the cave. Mirage was engaged to Dave Adamson, one of the cavers who was still inside the cave. Because it was now raining, Mirage went to a nearby barn to stay dry and wait for the other cavers to emerge. What started out as a light rain soon turned into a torrential downpour and Mirage started to get very worried. She knew that the caves filled up very quickly with water, and she knew that the cavers inside had no idea that it was raining so hard outside. Very soon, a torrent of water engulfed the cave entrance and flooded the initial passageway. By nine o'clock that night, a little sinkhole of spinning water had formed at the cave entrance, and Mirage knew this was very, very bad. She ran through the heavy rain for two miles until she reached Yarnbury Farm, where she asked the farmer, a man named Riley, to call the police. Once the word spread that there were people in Mostel Caverns and it was raining that hard, everyone knew this was a very bad situation. By 11 p.m. that evening, the rescue effort was in full swing. The police brought in a group called the Upper Wharfdale Fell Rescue Team, which had aided in cave rescues in the past. The problem was, Mossdell Caverns was totally unmapped. This was a very advanced caver destination, and even the rescue team was afraid to enter, especially in the rain. The two leaders of this rescue club got on the phone and called all of the local pubs around the area that were frequented by cavers. Two men, part of the Happy Wanderers, who had left the cave earlier in the day, were drinking at the Martin Arms Pub near Ingleton. When the bartender told them about the phone call, these two men grabbed their gear and headed back to the cave entrance. Their gear wasn't even dry yet. They'd been out of the cave a few hours, but they were going back. Before long, cavers from Yorkshire, Lancashire, Derbyshire, and Cheshire had all joined the rescue effort, carpooling through the pouring rain towards the cave entrance. When they got there, their hearts sank. Mostel was now effectively a lake. The cave entrance was completely submerged and the cavers knew that meant the cavern was underwater. Their only hope was that the six men inside had found a large opening in the cave where the water wouldn't reach the ceiling. But even then, their oxygen would be limited. Word continued to spread through the area. And soon, coming through the dark night and the pouring rain, rescuers saw a set of headlights and then another and then another. 
all of the area farmers had jumped on their mechanical diggers and their tractors and they had headed to the caves to try and start digging. As the sun rose on the morning of June 25th, the meadow looked like a battlefield. Hundreds of volunteers were digging a diversion ditch to try and divert the water away from the cave entrance. The ditch was six feet wide and 10 feet deep and almost 100 yards long. Most of the volunteers were digging with their bare hands. The team hurriedly built a makeshift dam almost 10 feet high and 70 yards long to try and stop the waters from flowing into the cave. The dam was fragile and it was unstable. Townspeople began arriving with truck beds full of sandbags to firm up the dam. 41-year-old Jim Iyer, one of the most admired cavers in Britain, showed up prepared to enter the cave. He had actually been invited to join the expedition the day before and go into the cave with the two groups, but he told the cavers he wanted nothing to do with Mostel Caverns. It was just too dangerous, even for him. Even so, there he stood, ready to go into the now flooded cave he hadn't dared enter the day before. He stood at the entrance, psyching himself up and muttering. Someone heard him say, Mostel mania, Russian roulette with nature. Jim bravely led a small team of men into the pitch black flooded cave, completely blind and with no inkling of what they might find inside. Outside, the volunteers continued to build and patch the dam as it collapsed over and over. The cavers began working in shifts, going in, coming out exhausted, and being spelled by fresh cavers. By late Sunday, 19 water pumps had been brought in by area fire departments. They were pumping water out of the cave as fast as they could, and thankfully, the rain finally let up. Jim Iyer knew, even though he and his team were sleep deprived, it was time to go back in. He took with him Jim Cunningham, John Shepard, John Rushton, and Frank Barnes, the four cavers from the Happy Wanderers group that escaped the cave a day earlier. I just wanna stop here for a moment and recognize the courage it must have taken for these four young men who must have been traumatized beyond belief to go back into this cave after they escaped to try and help their friends. Their friends are trapped somewhere that they got out of and they're willing to go back in and possibly get trapped again. Jim Iyer actually told the men he thought they were too traumatized and did not want them to go back inside, but they absolutely insisted. Jim took with him a long telephone cable to try and communicate with the service team. Remember, this is way before cordless phones, but because of the waters in the cave, the cord shorted out and didn't work. The group reached an area in the cave known as the Rough Chamber, which is a room-sized cavern in which you're able to stand up. The men inside the cave would later recall hearing strange sounds coming from deep in the cave, and one later said that the entire time his heart was in his throat, he felt very spooked and he wanted to turn back, but he knew he could not. Jim Iyer, the older caver, tried to tell the younger cavers that soon they'd hear the voices of their friends calling out to them. He was trying to lighten the mood. The men were exhausted and their minds started to play tricks on them. Several times they thought they heard voices echoing or people splashing in the water. Back on the surface, volunteers were doing everything they could to hold the dam. If that dam broke, the rescuers inside the cave would drown. Another expert caver named Tony Waltham arrived at Mosdell. He would later say that even as he stepped into the cave to try and help, he knew there was a very ominous feeling in that cave. Tony entered anyway. He made his way past the rough chamber and continued on to the 900 foot, five hour crawl known as the Far Marathon, which is 10 inches high and only two feet wide. It is, of course, like I said, pitch black as well. Whew, I just feel like I need a little mind palate cleanser. Ugh. Tony passed the initial team of rescuers crawling on his belly, and then he came to the first body. He felt around and he found the second, and then he knew at least two of the cavers had drowned. He couldn't get past the second body, so he had to crawl over the top of it. A few yards past the first two bodies, he found three more. By this time, Jim Iyer and his group had joined Tony and they were looking for the sixth body, hoping beyond hope that there might be a survivor. The experienced cavers were now experiencing claustrophobia for the first time in their lives. Their nerves were frazzled. They were exhausted and they were spooked. 
some of the men were openly weeping about the deaths of their friends. Others vomited upon seeing the bodies of their dead friends. Tony Waltham was in the lead and he knew the men had had enough. He yelled back to the group, go back Jim, they're all dead. Jim was then able to get the telephone cord working and he called up to the surface. He told the rescuers of the grisly discovery and the rescuers instructed him to speed everyone out now. The man on the phone at the surface didn't want to panic Jim and the other cavers, but he knew something they did not, and that was that the dam was not going to hold much longer. It was visibly dissolving and trembling and the rain had started again. The dam had collapsed twice that hour already. Jim and the four happy wanderers made their way to the surface and stood along the rescuers in a human chain, trying to make sure the dam did not break so Tony could get out. The only caver that had not been found was John Ogden. Was he still alive? No one was willing to give up without finding him. It was decided to call in the legend Bob Leakey, the man who first discovered the cave. Bob arrived at the scene and even at 53 years old, told the rescuers he was willing to go in. He went as far as he could, but the rain continued to fall and Bob had to turn around. That was the last time Bob would ever go into a cave. After this incident, he said he was done. The search for John Ogden continued through Monday and Tuesday. TV news crews arrived, onlookers arrived, and the news spread throughout the country and then the world. There had been a terrible tragedy at Mosdell Caverns. On July 27th, a final attempt was made by John Ogden's friend, Brian Boardman. He led an exhausted six-man team in to try and find John. The team came to the five bodies and one by one crawled over them. Then they found John's gold ring and then they found his boot. John had removed those items and placed them on ledges so they could be found. The cavers went as far as they could, but they never found John Ogden's body. Expert cavers stated that John had probably been in the lead, and when the cave flooded, his body was pushed ahead much farther than the other five, so it was most likely lodged in a terribly narrow area, one that could not and would not ever be reached. The rain continued to fall, and the police, the coroner, and the parents of the cavers had a meeting. It was decided that retrieval of the bodies was impossible. The coroner got special permission from the home office and the entrance to Mosdale Caverns was permanently sealed with the bodies inside. Word went out that the cave was now to be respected as a grave. The rescuers were shattered. The official report reads, death by misadventure and then states, never has so much been done by so many people for such a small reward. Two weeks later, hundreds of mourners gathered at the Church of St. Mary's in Conestone for a memorial service. The tragedy became known in the caving community as Caving's Battle of the Somme. People still tell stories and wear the label saying, I was at Mosdell as a badge of honor. On the 40th anniversary of the tragedy, this remembrance was held. Cavers have since gone into the caves via other entrances. They have renamed the large chamber, the Sanctuary. A gold plaque now marks the former cave entrance to remember the lives that were lost that day. It lists the names of the six men who died there and says, rest in Mosdell Caverns, where they died June 24th, 1967. It then says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my strength. Our second story is less tragic in the way that it only involves one death instead of six, but in other ways, it is much more horrific. Imagine being right there with your loved one who is stuck between two rocks and there is nothing you can do to help him. It's March of 1982 and our story takes place in New Jersey at Crooked Swamp Cave. It involves 48-year-old Donald Weltner who worked as a state police sergeant and was also the area scoutmaster. Donald wanted to take his scouts on a great adventure and he thought they would love to go cave exploring. He took members of Troop 116 of Millstone Township to explore the cave. But knowing the boys were inexperienced cavers, Donald wisely kept the exploration short and very safe. The group didn't go too far into the cave on the day he took the Boy Scouts. But in March of 1982, Donald returned to the cave with his two sons. Christopher was 14 and Roger was 11. Christopher and Roger were also part of the Boy Scout troop, so they'd been in the caves with their dad and with their entire troop. 
but on this day, it was just Donald and his boys. The Cricket Swamp is apparently a beautiful place. It sits near some bogs and fields, and there's even a bird sanctuary across from the cave. This creates all kinds of beautiful sound as the birds sing, especially the warblers that populate the nearby brambles. The bog is full of frogs that croak constantly, and so you can imagine this very serene setting in March. It must have felt very much like spring and very much like the earth was being born again. There's nothing outwardly ominous about this cave. From the surface, it simply looks like a gentle knoll that rises out of the ground but underneath there is a 1,250 foot passageway, and it was at the time an uncharted labyrinth. The three cavers, Donald, Christopher, and Roger, went deeper into the cave than they'd gone before. In fact, they went so far into the cave that they reached an area that had not even been mapped out. Donald had a lot of caving experience, but unknown to him, there is a passage that narrows severely deep inside the cave. The three crawled through the cave until they came to this narrow cone-shaped passage. As Donald and his boys continued, Donald became wedged at a right angle in a narrow spot in the cave. His head was lodged down in a crevice at a 30 degree downward angle. Once he was stuck, he was stuck. Every time he tried to move, it only made things worse. He couldn't move forward, he couldn't move backward. His two sons tried everything they could to help their father. They pushed and they pulled, but there was absolutely no budging Donald. His body was wedged into one crevice and his head was wedged into another, so he was doubly stuck. It wasn't just one area of Donald's body that was stuck, it was bad. Christopher and Roger spent an hour and a half trying to get their dad free, but they could not. The boys were able to maneuver themselves out of the cave and they went for help and the authorities were notified. Immediately, numerous rescue groups arrived, some of them coming from hundreds of miles away. Of course, the first thing they did was to go inside the cave and try to pull Donald out. In the beginning, it was kind of assumed that the boys, because they were young, they were just not strong enough to pull this grown man out and that the grown men would be able to get Donald unstuck. Well, they had no idea how badly he was stuck. Donald was wedged so tightly in there that there was nothing the rescuers could do. They tried and tried to pull Donald out by his feet, but his body and his head were simply too jammed in there. The next thing they did was to send cave rescuers in through another opening to try and get at Donald from another angle. These rescuers crawled clear through the cave system only to find that they got two feet away from Donald's head and at that point, the cave was almost completely closed off. So when I said it was a cone shape, what they found that it was actually like a double cone shape. It was a V and a V. These rescuers that were so close to Donald could actually hear him talking through an opening that was just inches big, but they couldn't see his head, let alone reach it. The temperatures in the cave were in the mid 50s, so the cold was becoming an issue very quickly. The concerns for Donald's ability to breathe and survive were growing rapidly. And so a nurse with some caving experience was sent into the cave. When she returned, she had really bad news. She went into the cave with hopes of getting some fluids into Donald. They obviously couldn't reach his head to give him a drink of water. So she was going to go in and try and start an IV. Well, by the time she got to Donald's body, he was not moving. The nurse pulled out her stethoscope and she could not hear a heart beating. The nurse tried to find a pulse in one of Donald's ankles, but she could not. She returned to the surface and informed the rescue crew that she believed Donald had died. Despite the bad news, the rescuers were determined to get Donald out of the cave. They brought in a drilling rig and drilled a 16 foot high vertical shaft into the cave. And then they carefully began chipping away a two foot square. So they drilled down 16 feet, two feet square. And then when they got to the place they thought they could stop drilling, they needed to go horizontally. So then they dug an 11 foot tunnel to Donald's body. When the rescuers got to Donald's body, they confirmed what they already knew. He was dead. Three days had passed, but they were not giving up. At first they tried pulling Donald's body out of its location. And it was really at this point when they realized just how doomed Donald had been. Even with much of the rock chipped away, Donald's body would not budge. Some of the rescuers later said that they weren't even sure how Donald got into the position that he was in. They said it was almost like the cave closed in around him once he was stuck. Rescuers attached a harness and ropes to the body and began to pull. They pulled and they pulled for six hours 
and in all of that time, they were only able to move the body a foot. The state police leader, Colonel Clinton Pagano, ordered that the eastern passage of the cave be blown up with dynamite, after which a rock drill and a backhoe would be used to clear the way. Thousands of volunteers had been working for days to try and get Donald's body out of this cave. Local residents brought eggs and meat and vegetables that were cooked in one of the local farmhouses to feed all of the people trying to assist. Dairy farmers brought their equipment, firemen and paramedics dug with shovels and their own hands. The state police were right there side by side with the professional cavers doing what they could to assist in the efforts. The rescuers brought in as many jackhammers as they could find in the area and they began to break the rock away. They got closer to the body and then they covered it with sleeping bags and blankets to protect it as much as they could and then more dynamite was set off. At last he was free. Donald's body was taken to Newton Memorial Hospital and then to the Sussex County Medical Examiner for autopsy. It was found that he had died of hypothermia. He had lived for almost two days, stuck in that horrible position, but he was most likely not completely conscious for the last 18 hours of his life. Donald Weltner was buried and the entire community mourned. His sons would now be just a couple of years older than I am, and I cannot imagine the trauma they've dealt with because of this tragedy. I want to send lots of love to them from our community. These are both terrible stories that remind us Mother Nature is firmly in charge. They're also stories that show us just how good people can be and how we can come together in a crisis to help our own. I would like to focus on that part of the stories as we remember the people who lost their lives in these stories. I think the best thing we can do to honor them is to remember we are a village and we need each other. We are better and stronger when we keep that in the forefront of everything we do. Thank you for joining me today on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. You can also join my Patreon for a couple bucks a month. That keeps the videos coming. We are also in the midst of a fundraiser. This is the thumbnail to the video that explains everything we are doing to raise money to donate to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that has never been tested. We would like to solve some cold cases by getting that DNA tested. I hope you know how much I appreciate you being here. Some of you have been with me for years now. I look forward to talking with you every week and I just appreciate you so much. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I will see you next time on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Bye.